All right, friends. Here's what's so cool about the best night of the week is we don't stop worshiping when Logan and the band leaves the stage. We actually continue worshiping Jesus. We just do it through the reading of his word. So that's what we're going to do because we're starting a new series called Beautiful Resistance. Beautiful Resistance. Isn't that a an awesome green color. I was kind of proud of that. That was a good design choice by Danny. Yeah. The series that we're starting tonight is going to lead into our winter retreat. So uh, the whole month of February, we're kind of covering one topic in depth, and then our weekend at the retreat is going to be really, really special uh, as, we, as we dig into this a little bit more. But I read, I read a book the author said something I thought was really powerful. I wanted to share it with you. He said that in a time of compromise and disillusionment, God is calling his people to a movement of beautiful resistance. In a time of compromise and disillusionment, God is calling his people to a movement of beautiful resistance. You see, it's so easy to fall into culture traps, culture traps of idolatry, of exhaustion, of apathy, of fear, of contempt, of hate, of cynicism. But followers of Jesus, we have a better way. We've been called to live an abundant life. Life. John chapter 10, verse 10 is a verse in the Bible that you guys should just memorize because it's so, so good. Jesus is talking. He says, the thief, meaning Satan, has come to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I, Jesus is talking, I have come that you may have life and life to the fullest and abundant and full life. That life, it's, it's marked by, by worship and rest, by, by hunger for God's word, by hospitality to neighbors, friends, and family, honor, sacrifice, celebration. That's the full abundant life that Jesus offers. And, and as middle schoolers, you have to practice your resistance to the culture. By building an identity that is rooted in Jesus, you've got to have cultural discernment for those messages that are trying to pull you. We've got to live out a counter-cultural mission. we got to be different. We have to be. Because if we're not different, then why would anybody else want to follow Jesus? That's the purpose of this series. That's what we're going to talk about all month long. How do we resist the culture traps and faithfully follow Jesus? So to start off this message, I've got a question for you. Anybody in here like bugs? Ah, yes, okay, some bug fans. All right. Um, I used to hate bugs. Anybody bug haters in this place? Yes, okay. I used to hate bugs. Uh, like, whenever I would see a bug, I would get freaked out. Uh, you know, like, I would see, like, a spider on the back wall, and I'd be like, because I can see it, it's too close. I don't care that I'm 30 feet away. Like, that's too close for me. But then, but then I moved into a house with my roommates, and my bedroom was in the basement. It still is in the basement. And that means I deal with spiders and centipedes on the regular. Like... I keep my vacuum cleaner just plugged into the wall at all times so I can just suck them up when I see them. Uh, But because I've gone to war against the spiders in my room, uh, I've sort of like adopted this mentality of like, if I can see you, if you're invading my space, like no mercy. I'm coming after you. You do not get to live any longer. Your time is done. Yeah, I used to be really freaked out. I used to be freaked out, but now I just kind of deal with it. Or like bees. I used to see bees outside and I would like run, like literally run away from bees because I was like, they're going to sting me. It's going to hurt. Well, see, that's the problem, right? They actually are more likely to sting you if you run. I didn't really get that. I was just scared. Terrifying. Have you guys ever seen a bee up close though? 
Yeah, I've got, I got some pictures. I got some pictures. Abigail, find the pictures. Yes, look at it. No, it's like, oh, it's actually kind of cute. Oh, that's a spider. But hey, but hey, but look how interesting that is. Look how cool that is. That's like a little jumping spider. One of the little jumping spiders that you see. That's a bee. Okay. That's a bee. It's got pollen on it. Look at it. He's got like little hairs and fuzz. Once, once I got like really up close and started seeing that bugs are actually like this. I mean, I don't. Pause. Pause. I do not hold bugs. Nope. I don't like pick them up and like look at them really close. But these photos that other people have taken, I can really appreciate. Look how cool that is. You get really, like, 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 look how intricate the design. Like, God made that. What? Do I like jazz? Like the music? That's a strange question to ask in the middle of my sermon. Look at how cool God must be to create things that are that small with that much detail. Bugs are actually pretty awesome. Bugs are actually pretty cool. And like bees are so valuable to our world, you guys. I don't know. That's okay. I don't need that. Okay. The title of tonight's message, the title of tonight's message is Honor Must Resist Contempt. Honor Must Resist Contempt. Contempt is one of these strong pulls in our world. It's one of these culture traps that I started talking about at the beginning. To have contempt is to feel that someone is beneath you. Basically that they are worthless. That, that you don't need to consider them at all. And we often don't even realize when we are slipping into contempt. Contempt for our siblings contempt for our parents, contempt for people around us, even contempt for God. And honestly, guys, here, this is my youth pastor heart, all right? I try to be a student of you. I try to observe you and study what you are like so that I know best how to pastor you, to say the things from God's word that you need to hear. And as I have been observing next this year, I have seen the spirit of contempt among us, among you. But it's not too late to reverse course. I often think that singers and songwriters are kind of like the prophets of today. Like, like God spoke through Old Testament prophets. That's how we got most of the scriptures that are found in the Old Testament. I think that singers and songwriters have a way today to put, to put truth sprinkled into their lyrics in a way that's actually really powerful. And uh, I heard a lyric that, that's going to tie into this message tonight. Um, it's a Taylor Swift lyric, actually, from her new album. Don't, I don't need your Taylor hate in this place. I don't need your Taylor cheers in this place. It just is what it is. Personally, I love Taylor. But here's the lyric. Here's the lyric. Familiarity breeds contempt. Familiarity breeds contempt. It's this thought that the closer we get to something, the more familiar with it that we become, the easier it is to have contempt for it but we resist contempt by showing honor. That's our big idea for tonight's message. It's the same as the title. Honor must resist contempt. Honor must resist contempt. We're going to be looking at a text in the book of Numbers tonight. And it is the month of February, and so if you were ever trying to have a convo with that cute someone, maybe you could be like, hey, you know, at next on Wednesday night, I was reading in the book of Numbers, and I realized I didn't have yours. Just kidding. Don't use that. That's so cheesy. That's so cheesy. Don't use that. Okay. In the book of Numbers, it's one of the first five books of the Bible. It's right at the beginning. In the book of Numbers, where we're going to pick up reading, 
God has rescued his people Israel from 400 years of slavery in Egypt. For 400 years, the Egyptians had oppressed Israel, forced them to build their pyramids and their monuments. But God shows up in miraculous ways in their lives. He miraculously saved Moses as a baby and made him to a great leader. He miraculously showed his power to Pharaoh so that Israel would be let go. He miraculously parted the Red Sea so that God's people could escape walking on dry land. He, he miraculously fed Israel in the desert with manna, this bread that fell down from heaven. He miraculously led Israel as a pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. His presence was with them, and he, he led them to a mountain called Mount Sinai. And there God met with Moses, and they, they got the terms of an agreement. We have it summarized as the Ten Commandments, but what that really was was, was God giving his people the terms of an agreement of what it was going to be like for him to be their God and for them to be his people. And they, they stayed at that mountain for about a year, and then they set off towards the land that God had promised them. He said that he was going to bring them into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, a land where they could build homes and settle down. These slaves who had been slaves for 400 years were finally going to get their own place. And God brings them to the very edge of the promised land. They're on the border. And Moses says, all right, before we go in, Let's go scout it out. Let's see what we're dealing with here. And so Moses sends 12 spies into this promised land to go see, to go see what it's like, go see what the people that are there are like, see what the cities are like, see what the produce is like. And these 12 spies, they go out for 40 days and 40 nights, and then they come back. And 10 of those spies come back, and they freak out. So the people, they're too big. They're like giants. They're too strong. They're going to kill us. Their cities are walled. We'll never be able to conquer them. We can't possibly go into this land. We will die. But two of the spies are like, no, 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 no. God has promised that he's going to give us this land. God has promised he's going to give us these things. We got to trust God. We got to go. This is our land. We have been given it. Even though Israel had seen God up close, Miracle after miracle after miracle. They had contempt for God. The familiarity bred contempt. And they didn't honor the Lord. So, get your Bibles. Numbers chapter 14 is where we're going to be. If you don't have a Bible, I'll have it up on the screens. If you want to have a Bible in front of you, there's a whole stack of them on that table near the door. Go snag one. Numbers chapter 14. We're going to pick up the story with the spies coming back. The people freaking out. Okay, everybody got it in front of them? Numbers 14, we're going to start right away at verse 1. Okay. Numbers chapter 14, verse 1. I think I'll probably read the first 12 verses. And again, it'll be up on the screens, the version I'm reading, which is New Living Translation. Okay. Then the whole community began weeping aloud, and they cried all night. Their voices rose in a great chorus of protest against Moses and Aaron. If only we had died in Egypt, or even out here in the wilderness, they complained. Why is the Lord taking us to this country, only having us die in battle our wives and our little ones will be carried off as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to just return to Egypt? Then they plotted among themselves, let's choose a new leader and head back to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell face down on the ground before the whole community of Israel. Two of the men who had explored the land, Joshua son of Nun and Caleb son of Jephunneh, tore their clothing. They said to all the people of Israel, the land we traveled through and explored is a wonderful land. And if the Lord is pleased with us, he'll bring us safely into that land and give it, give it to us. It's a rich land flowing with milk and honey. Don't rebel against the Lord and don't be afraid of the people of the land. They are only helpless prey to us. They have no protection, but the Lord is with us. Don't be afraid of them. But the whole community began to talk about stoning Joshua and Caleb. 
Then the glorious presence of the Lord appeared to all the Israelites at the tabernacle. And the Lord said to Moses, How long will these people treat me with contempt? Will they never believe me, even after all the miraculous signs I have done among them? I will disown them and destroy them with a plague. Then I will make you into a nation greater and mightier than they are. Who boy. Honor must resist contempt. Here's how we do it. My first point tonight is get closer. Get closer. Remember the T-Swift lyric, familiarity breeds contempt. When you're so close to something for so long, it can lose its specialness. And that's exactly what has happened to the people of Israel as we're reading about it in Numbers 14. They had seen miracle after miracle after miracle. They had seen God up close and personal. But despite all of that, contempt for God grew in their hearts. All of a sudden, none of it was good enough anymore. They didn't want God anymore. They they even said they wished that they were back in Egypt, that they had just died there. They'd rather be in slavery. Imagine having so much disregard for God and the things that he had done in your life. The things that were literally happening before your very eyes that you would rather go back to where you had just been in slavery for 400 years instead of trusting God once again. Even after all the miracles, the people still didn't really believe God. They didn't honor God. See, the problem that they had It actually isn't being too close. It's not being close enough. Israel didn't need more distance from God. They didn't need fewer miracles. They didn't need to be away from his presence. They needed to get closer. They had allowed the things that God was doing around them to become commonplace. They stopped being amazed with how incredible God is. Familiarity bred contempt, but familiarity and closeness are not the same thing. When we really get close to God, we see rightly how valuable he is, how amazing he is, how beautiful he is. That's what honor is. Honor is recognizing the value of something and then treating it that way. And the best way to honor God, to recognize his value, is to get even closer. I wonder how often Israel's attitude towards God in that moment is something that we have in our own hearts. Like they said, they'd rather go back to Egypt than face the hard parts of like entering the promised land. And even though God had promised that he was going to go with them and give them victory. They still wanted to go back to slavery because they thought that that would be easier. Is that you? Have you been thinking that it's easier to just not follow God? Have you been thinking that, you know, church is fun and, and all nice, next is pretty cool, but, but when push comes to shove, you'd rather just take the easy way out instead of following Jesus into what he has called you to? Like God has called you to purity, but it's just easier to stay in sin. God has called you to obedience, but it's easier to just just do it the way that you want to do it. God's called you to be bold in sharing your faith with people who don't know Jesus, but it's easier to just stay quiet. God wants you to take those next steps, those hard steps, to go deeper in your faith, to get closer to him. If you stay where you are, you run a very real risk of being just close enough to fall into the trap of contempt. Like we spend so much time around church, around God's word, around our brothers and sisters in Christ that we forget how special what we are doing right now in this moment really is. Around here, what do we call Wednesday nights? The best night of the week. Why is it the best night of the week? Because we gather together like this to worship Jesus. We are all giving up one night out of our week to come together and worship our King. And we do it every single week. 
If you want to make Wednesday nights the best night of the week, come here ready to honor God. We honor God in our worship by engaging our hearts and our minds in what we're singing and not distracting others. We honor God when we read his word by putting the things into practice that we hear. It's called obedience. We honor God in our fellowship, the way that we hang out with one another, interact with one another, by recognizing that each person here is somebody that Jesus died for. Which is a perfect transition into my second point. Honor the Imago Day. Honor the Imago Day. One of the strongest pulls in our culture is to have contempt for other people. Remember, contempt is like looking down at somebody. And chances are you've either done this or been around this at some point earlier today. In your heart, you showed contempt for someone because you thought that they were beneath you. It makes me so sad to remember back to who I was in high school and the conversations that I would have around lunchroom tables with my friends. Like the way that we would make fun of people, treat people. Like I remember thinking less of people who had different interests than me. Like I was a football player and so I'd make fun of like theater kids because we didn't share any interests. Like I remember thinking less of somebody because of the way that they dressed. Like they weren't that cool or stylish. I remember thinking less of like the freshman class when I was a senior because they were like annoying or and, and, you know, my brother was in that class that probably played into it. But, like, that's where my heart was. That's what my mind was like as I showed contempt for, like, everybody around me who wasn't like me. As followers of Jesus, we have to recognize the Imago Dei in every person. The, the Imago Dei, it means the image of God. In the very, very first page of our Bible, when God is creating human beings, he says that we are making them in our very image. Right? That human beings are made in the very image of God. That means that human beings have value and worth regardless of what has happened to them in their past or where they come from, regardless of what they're interested in or the way that they dress. People who are made in God's image are not deserving of contempt. Think about it this way. What's this? It's a $20 bill. Pretty crispy. Folded a couple of times. Delaney, how much is this worth? $20. You want it? Okay. What about now? You still want it? You still want it? How much is this worth right now, Bryn? It's, worth, it's still worth $20, even though I, I crinkled it up. What about now? You still want this? Why? It's still $20? Oh, yeah? You still want this? Why? Because it's still worth $20 no matter what has been done to that dollar bill. No matter where it came from, it is still worth $20. You go to a store, the cashier is going to honor that as worth $20. That dollar bill has value and it will be honored. Do you get the image? You're making the connection? There's a command that we need to follow found in Romans chapter 12. I'm going to put it up on the screen. It's found in verse 10. Paul writes this. He says, love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. What if instead of the culture trap of having contempt for other people, we instead made it like a friendly competition amongst ourselves to outdo one another in how much honor we show people. What if every single place that we went, we treated people with honor and dignity 
because they were made in the image of God. The server at the restaurant and the person at the drive through window. We show them honor by seeing them as someone made in the image of God. Like a business person dressed all nice and a homeless person sitting at a crosswalk asking for money, we show them both honor by treating them as someone made in the image of God. Your teachers at school, the small group leaders here at Next, outdo one another in showing honor by seeing them as somebody that Jesus died for. Someone that was made in the image of God and therefore has value and worth, no matter if they're like you or not like you? What if we showed as much honor to the custodians in this building as we showed to pastors? You guys know that I wear a few different hats around this place. One of them, obviously, is that I am the middle school pastor here. I'm also one of our custodians part-time. No, no, no. I don't say that for claps. I say that to show you a little bit of my experience. You see... You see, when I'm, when I'm not here on stages or, or prepping sermons or meeting with students, sometimes you can find me vacuuming carpets or cleaning toilets or emptying trash cans into dumpsters. And it's been crazy to see the difference in how people treat me. Because there are people in this building who know that I'm a pastor, and they'll come up to me and they'll be like, like why are you doing that? Like, that's not your job. Like, why, why are you doing that? But then there's people who don't know that I'm a pastor. And to see the way that They've treated me with contempt because I'm pushing around a little cleaning cart, going from bathroom to bathroom. Like, honestly, it's, it's almost like I was, like, wearing, like, an invisibility cloak or something. Like, that, like, I don't even register on their faces as, like, another human being. It's wild. It's easy to see someone as less than you. But the way of Jesus is different. Honor must resist contempt. Let me see if I can uh, help this land home in your life a little bit. I meet with a lot of students, a lot of you, and I've heard something in a lot of your stories. I fight with my dad all the time. I don't respect my mom because she doesn't know this or this or this. That familiarity breeds contempt. There's probably no closer relationship that you have right now than your parents in terms of your proximity and time spent together. And so it actually doesn't surprise me in the slightest that God would put as one of the Ten Commandments to honor your father and mother. Right? It's Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. Because it's so easy to fall into the trap of contempt when it's someone as close to you as your parents. Be like, okay, boomer, like you don't know anything about me. Do you sense the spirit of contempt in just that phrase? That you're like, you can't tell me anything because of your age, really? I think that this is a perfect area to practice outdoing one another in showing honor. In, in putting it into practice in your actual life, not just being something we talk about. Right? Remember that honor means that you value something and then treat it according to that value. You might disagree with your parents. How many of you have ever had a disagreement with your parents about something? All of us, right? You might feel misunderstood by your parents. Anybody in here ever felt like, like my parents just don't get me? Yeah, a lot of you, right? Your parents might even sin against you, right? Like, that might be true, but they are made in the image of God. Jesus died for them, and God in his wisdom and sovereignty made them your parents. He placed them as an authority in your life and as the ones who are given the task of discipling you. Proverbs 13 verse 1 says that a wise child accepts a parent's discipline A mocker refuses to listen to correction. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, quotes that Exodus chapter chapter 20. When Paul writes, he says, Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord, for this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother, 
This is the first commandment with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you, and you will have a long life on the earth. Make a note. If you're a note taker, make a note right now about a way that you can put this into practice even tonight when you get in the car with your parents. Or if someone else is dropping you off, like the next time you see them, maybe when you walk in the door tonight, or when you wake up in the morning. Like, like how can you show honor to your parents? Or what about your friends? How do you honor your friends? How do you outdo one another in showing honor? You know, a lot of jokes get made at like other people's expense, right? And that's sometimes just like what friends do, right? We, we joke with one another, we kind of put each other down. We might think it's not a big deal. But you can really easily hurt somebody when you're just joking around. What if we made it the norm in this room, in our culture, to show everybody honor? There's a quote from C.S. Lewis, and no surprise, I love C.S. Lewis, and so I love, I love quoting C.S. Lewis. It's like back-to-back -back messages where I'm talking about C.S. Lewis. But he has this quote, I'll put it up on the screen for you because I want you to see it too. He said that there are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. This doesn't mean that we are to be perpetually solemn, like we don't got to be serious all the time. We must play, have fun, joke. But our merriment must be of the kind which exists between people who have, from the outset, taken each other seriously. No flippancy, no superiority, no presumption. In other words, no contempt. We don't treat people as less than we treat them with honor because they're made in God's image. Familiarity breeds contempt, but we resist the culture trap to slip into that way of thinking. Honor is the way of Jesus. And we honor everyone because they are made in God's image. The Imago Dei. We honor our parents. We honor our friends. We honor our siblings. We honor strangers. Everyone. And above all, we honor God. Honor must resist contempt. Now, I just want to close this message by talking about Jesus, because Jesus died in the most contemptible way possible so that we could have the honor of being made right with God. That's the gospel. Jesus was beaten, and he was whipped, and he was laughed at by the soldiers doing it. He was nailed to a cross the most torturous way that human beings have ever invented for how to kill another person. Hebrews 12, 2 has this great gospel truth embedded in it. It says, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith, because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame, now he is seated in the place of honor besides God's throne. He was on that cross for you. You, where you are sitting right now, you were the joy that Jesus saw. He was willing to go through the most contemptible and shame-filled way to die because he saw you one day following him, believing in him, sharing the gospel with other people people. He took your punishment. He won the fight against sin so that you could be in a right relationship with God. That is the gospel. That is why we call ourselves Christians. That is why we show up on a Wednesday night to worship Jesus. And if you don't know Jesus like that, but you want to, I would love to have a conversation with you. I know Grace would love to have a conversation with you. I know Jake would love to have a conversation with you. Your small group leader would love to have a conversation with you about what it looks like to follow Jesus. Because I promise you, I promise you, following Jesus changes everything. It changes the way that we live. We don't have to fall into culture traps like contempt anymore. We can live different. We can be different. We got a fun month ahead of us, including winter retreat, friends. I'm excited to continue studying God's word with you as we go through this series. So let me close by praying.
and we'll wrap up for the night. Lord Jesus, thank you that you've given us a different way. That we don't have to live like everybody else lives. We don't have to fall into these culture traps. We don't have to live by showing contempt for other people because you've given us a better way. So Jesus, would you help us to honor you in the way that you deserve? Jesus, would you help us to honor people because you have created them in your image? God, would you give us grace for when we screw up and we don't do those things well? And Lord, if there's somebody in here who doesn't know you, God, would you not even let them go to sleep tonight until they've wrestled with what it would mean to know you as Lord and Savior of their lives? Thanks for the time that we've had tonight, Jesus. Thank you for the month that we have ahead. I pray all this in your name. Amen.